forward as well. Be before I excuse our kids for Children's Church, let me show a, a few pictures. We had a, a junior high retreat this weekend, and I joined the junior highers Friday night and Saturday. Here we go. We were at Community Covenant Church in Scotts Valley. If you remember Brian McCutcheon, he's on staff at that church, along with uh, Pastor Jeremiah, their new lead pastor. Here's some of the students. We did lessons at Community Covenant and then hit the beach yesterday. Beautiful day in October at the beach and uh, great time with the kids. And thank you to all the leaders who helped out with that as well. And uh, Jeff Colin, great job over the weekend. So good time. Today we are in Nehemiah. And let me invite our kids to head off for Children's Church through second grade. They can go and meet their leaders out in the front room. I'll ask our ushers after the kids leave. Ushers can walk down the aisles if you don't mind with a few Bibles. If you need a Bible today, raise your hand if you see an usher walking by and they will hand out a Bible to you. You can start turning to Nehemiah chapter 5. And let me mention as, uh, as we're doing that, Next April, our church is going to be hosting our Pacific Southwest Conference Celebration. I, I got a call from Anita at our conference office, and Pacific Southwest Conference, that's Covenant Churches in California, Arizona, Hawaii, Nevada, maybe Utah, but um, we gather every year. The pastors gather, representatives from churches gather, and they've contact, contacted us and said, hey, can we use your facility? And so as we see God using our renewed facilities through things like last week, we had the Jana Lyra concert, um, certainly with our congregation on Sunday mornings, but even beyond our congregation, next April, uh, we will be hosting the conference annual meeting. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, we will be asking many of you to help with that as we prepare to host. So that'll be great. We are in a study on the book of Nehemiah. If you're a guest here today, maybe you haven't been with us this fall, we're looking at an Old Testament book. You can turn to Nehemiah. If, if you go to Psalms, which is in the middle of your Bible, go back a few books. That's how I find it. A small Old Testament book, it's about building a wall. So what does that have to do with us? You know, here we are, uh, centuries, millennia later, we're reading about building a wall in an ancient city of Jerusalem. How does that relate to us today? Well, what we've been looking at in Nehemiah points to Jesus. There's lessons from Nehemiah's life that we can learn, but, but ultimately we want to consider what does God want to do in our lives through Jesus Christ, and how does Nehemiah uh, give us an example, but also point us to Jesus and what Jesus offers for us. And, and as we think about that, let me give a little introduction story that will give some background on Nehemiah as well. Like, most, like many of us, I have some household projects that I am often pushed to do. I, I, I put off projects as much as I can. Sometimes projects get worse and worse. That was a problem with my sprinklers in the backyard. I thought it was a small leak, but the leak got worse and worse. I thought I could put off fixing it just by turning off the sprinklers and hand watering for a while, but the leak continued. So I realized it wasn't just my valves, the water going out, it was the water coming into the sprinkler valves that was leaking. So as the puddle grew and grew uh, next to the side of my house, which was no longer dirt, but mud and water, um, I had to turn off the water coming into my backyard, begin to dig it out. What I discovered was I thought it was just a simple little PVC pipe leak at the top. Maybe I bumped into the, you know, pipes and cracked at something. What it really was, it was at the very bottom of these pipes, a few feet down in the dirt, uh, it had cracked. And so I dug it all out. It, it uh, was a, I'm amazed at how much dirt came out. But um, I, I dug it all out, realized it's something I couldn't fix. So I had to bring in somebody to fix it for me. And uh, finally it's fixed. I, I turned the water back on. Now I, I recognize there's some other drips going on. But anyways, the, 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 the main leak is fixed. But what I realized, of course, in my digging was I, I had to go deeper. I, I had to dig down deeper. That, that source of that water um, was further than I, was deeper than I had imagined. I, I shared this story after the first service. Um, Rick Wilcox came up and said, Mark, I had the same thing, but what I had, I had tree roots growing into my sprinklers. 
And of course, those tree roots, why did they do that? They're looking for water. And when it starts leaking, they keep growing. Uh, think of our own lives. We've been talking about Nehemiah. Last week, we talked about integrity. How do we develop integrity in our lives? Uh, Nehemiah showed integrity. Jesus showed integrity in his ministry and in his life. Some of you may come back now a week later and you say, Mark, I'm not sure the Christian life works, or at least it doesn't work for me. It's great on Sundays. It's great, you know, Joey's up there singing, the choir's up there singing. It's, it's wonderful. But then Monday hits, and I'm not sure it works. Living lives of integrity, following Jesus, being committed to my Christian faith. You know, for some of us, we, we have these moments where we say, this is great. It's, it's the fullness of God. It's, it's the wells of springing water coming up within me. But then we get fears, anxieties, pressures of life, the realities of life hit. And we say, where's that fullness? But let me say this. It's in those times we have to dig deeper. We have to reach down deeper to get to those uh, springs of water that God has for us. Sometimes they're just on the surface, and it's great. We, we come here on Sunday. It's, it's amazing. But sometimes God calls us to reach down deeper and experience him at an even deeper level. And that's what we see with Nehemiah. We see Nehemiah in the midst of challenge, temptation. He digs deeper. He fears God. He, he allows God to supply his needs in ways that nothing else can. Nehemiah chapter 5. We pick up in verse 14. Verse 14, through the end of chapter 5, it's almost parenthetical. It's, it's Nehemiah pausing a minute to say, and, and this is what kind of happened to me in the midst of this building project. Verse 14, moreover, he says, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be governor in the land of Judah, until the 32nd year, 12 years, Neither I nor my brothers ate food allotted to the governor. So what he says there is that he was appointed governor for 12 years. Something has happened in Nehemiah. Now he not only is leading a building project, but he has been promoted. He's been elevated. And so for Nehemiah, he has to deal with a new temptation. And in this promotion, and I call it the fear of self-promotion. Maybe some of us think, you know, I, I can deal with that fear of getting promoted, of, uh, of realizing success. He has to deal with the temptations that come with success. How is he going to handle it? Maybe this is the toughest challenge Nehemiah has yet to face. He's had to face down corruption. He's had to face down inflation, rising prices, people who didn't want to work, people who had to mortgage what they had just to get by. But Nehemiah has to face the challenge of success. How is he going to handle the temptation? And, and how might success for us ruin us? Nehemiah has been promoted governor. Um, as I look out here in the congregation, there are many of us who have been successful. Many of us who have received promotions, who have been put in the place of influence with other people, influence even just within our families, with those around us. How do we handle that when we're placed in those positions of influence? How do we handle it when God gives us success? John Wesley said this. He says, John Wesley, uh, a, a, a great reformer in church history, religious revival is doomed to never last long. He says, why is this? It's because religious revival produces both industry and frugality, which inevitably lead towards prosperity and success, which distract from religious impulses. This is what John Wesley says. He says revival, and he was a great revivalist. He says revival doesn't last long because what happens is uh, people live healthy lives. 
They're industrious. They're, they're prosperous. And then what happens is, in, in his language, they become distracted from religious impulses. He says it's this cycle. So how do we deal with these, this temptation of success? Look, look what's happened with Nehemiah's contemporaries. You know, we, we hear these stories of people who gain power you know, their predecessors were evil. They were uh, tyrannical. They were oppressive. And, and then somebody else comes into the power. You, you hope for something different, but they become sometimes even worse than their predecessors. What's going to happen with Nehemiah? Look, look at what it's described at, verse 15. The earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people. They took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine. Their assistants also lorded over people. So Nehemiah's predecessors, they lorded over people. They took extra. They burdened the people. Remember, there was a famine in the land. People were struggling to get by. But they took not only what was supposed to be theirs, but extra as well. They, they misused their positions of influence and power. Think about this. Think about bosses that you've had, people you've had to work under in your life. Uh, who is the best boss you've ever had? Who's, who is the best? Just think about that a minute. Um, somebody you just enjoyed working under was a great example to you, but who was the worst boss? Maybe that's maybe more interesting to think about. Who's the worst boss? Who is that person that lorded over you? Who is that person who kind of rubbed it in your face a little bit? They had the corner office. Uh, they had the big window. Um, they, they could tell you what to do. I don't know if you uh, remember that phrase, uh, membership has its privileges. Well, sometimes when we are in positions of influence, we're in positions of authority, uh, there's privileges. As I thought about this even here at the church, my office is the big office. I'm the lead pastor. I get the big office. Um, mine is the office where we have meetings. So there's couch and chairs and that kind of thing. My office has the bathroom. I don't know why they built an office, you know, with a bathroom. Mine has the bathroom. I've actually said this to Pastor Ted. I said, Ted, now you go to, you're going to go to another church. If you ever build, build your office with a bathroom. Not because you're going to use it a lot. Like, I don't use that bathroom hardly ever at all. Like, I don't want somebody coming out of my office and me saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm in the bathroom. You know, I don't, <laughs> but, but when we do baptisms, it's great because I don't have to go into the men's restroom with everybody else and change. I get my own bathroom where I can change. So I said, Ted, build a bathroom. As a lead pastor, privilege. But, what did that mean for Nehemiah? Was he tempted in the midst of success to follow in that example of misuse of power? So maybe one alternative for us would be to say this. Don't take the promotion. Just don't do it. If, if you're going to follow God, if you're going to follow Jesus, it means, you know, not being in positions of power. I don't think that's our example here. And I'm going I'm to mention what Nehemiah does in just a moment. But let's first think of some other Old Testament examples. Joseph, remember Joseph, uh, appointed to a position of power, rules over Egypt. What does he do? He gathers, over seven years, he gathers. There, there's prosperity. He's gathering. But what's the purpose of that? So that in the seven lean years, they're able to provide for people's needs. So sometimes we, we receive prosperity, uh, success, not just for us, but even for others. Sometimes God will bless a business, just not to bless you, but to bless those who work with you. Think of Daniel. Daniel rises to a position of, of influence and power in the Old Testament it's so that his light can shine. And not just in, in a small area, but over all the other rulers and, and to the king. Now, Nehemiah, what, what does he do? He says in, in the previous verse, he says, 
Neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governors. He never took extra. In fact, he doesn't even take a salary. He never uses his expense account. He doesn't levy extra taxes. He refuses to buy land that could be bought cheaply in this time of famine. He pays his servants out of his own pocket. He daily feeds over 150 people at his own expense. How does he handle this temptation? How how does he dig deeper? Look at the end of verse 15. He says, But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. It was reverence for God. He feared God. He trusted in God. He dug deeper. Even in, in, even in success, he refused to allow that to pull him away from being what God wanted him to do. Paige Brown uh, writes on Nehemiah 5 and 6, and she asked the question, thinking about God's assignment for Nehemiah, did Nehemiah like construction? Interesting question. Did he like construction? Look at verse 16. And he says, Instead, I devoted myself to the work on the wall. All my men were assembled for the work. We didn't acquire any land. And then it goes on to say what he did, how he provided for people. He, he uh, provided food for people. Verse 19. Remember me with favor, my God, for all that I have done. But did Nehemiah like his work? She goes on to ask these questions. Did Noah... Did Noah like animals? Think about that. Did Moses like camping? Did Ruth like gleaning? Did did Daniel like living abroad? Did John the Baptist like confrontation? I I actually think he did, looking at his personality. (laughs) Did Paul like prison? She goes on to say this. These people did not necessarily love their assignments, but they feared the Lord. These were assignments God gave them. They they didn't love things, but they feared God. Here, Nehemiah says, out of reverence for God, I didn't act like that. He chose to act honorably, to fear God, to be used in a position of power and influence in a godly way. And as a result, he led by example He devoted himself to the work. It wasn't that he would necessarily love the work, but he devoted himself to it. And he loved people. He provided for people. Let me read verse 17. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from surrounding nations. He provided for people. He loved people. What a great example for us. So you think of the, the boss that lorded over you, your worst boss, your best boss. Why was that person your best boss? Because they loved people. You knew that they loved you. I had a football coach in high school. I, I went to uh, his funeral on Wednesday, and it was, it was really a wonderful experience. Um, It was kind of like a class reunion. His last year of coaching was 1988. I graduated in 85. So it was guys a little bit younger than me and a little bit older than me. And a bunch of us were there. So it was like a class reunion, but just with football players. And uh, it it was great. One of the things I appreciated about Coach Muster was his love for people. And, And one of his sons spoke at the memorial service. His son, Clay. Clay also helped coach. Um, He had four sons. One of his one of his sons, I'll throw this out because somebody mentioned to me after the first service, one of his sons was a guy named Brad Muster. So any Stanford or Cal fans, Brad Muster played in the 80s and uh, at Stanford and then eventually with the Bears, Coach Muster's son. Clay told the story of his dad. He said his dad attended church every Sunday. Their tradition in their church was to come forward for communion. His dad sat in the front seat on the aisle and anybody who came forward for communion um, who walked by his dad, his dad would turn and shake hands with that person before they received communion. And he said this, he said, you know, we we often thought about this. If some visitor came to our church, they would say, that's kind of a strange church. There's this old guy who sits in the front seat who shakes hands with every person before they receive communion. 
And uh, they never like stopped him from doing that. But uh, why did he do that? Because he loved people. That's Nehemiah. And, and that's, that's the example for us. When, when God puts us in those places of success and prosperity and blessing, how are we going to be known? Are we going to be known as that person with a nice house? Or that person with a cool car? Or that person who just has that outfit and they, they were just, you know, they, they, they dressed well? Or are we going to be known when God puts us in places of blessing as people who love others, a love for people? Well, we're going to look at chapter 6 and, and some things there. Before we move on to chapter 6, I want to quickly show a two-minute video. This is a trailer for a movie that's coming up. It's about a guy who loved people. So I thought this really fit in well with Nehemiah. Um, the movie is called Muster. Did I get No, Muster. That's my coach. Mully. <laughs> The movie is called Molly. It's coming out to the State Theater a week from Wednesday. It's one day showing. Uh, some of my pastor buddies here in Modesto, they're, they're looking to bring that movie here. It's promoted by Focus on the Family. And so it's a week from Wednesday at the State Theater. I think there's information in your uh, bulletin and on our weekly current email. But let's, let's see this video. Yeah, so th those dates were for a different showing. Uh, this showing is coming up a week from Wednesday. Nehemiah chapter 6. So we first talked about the fear of... of uh, um, Nehemiah 6 is the fear of self-protection. Nehemiah 5 was the fear of self-promotion. We come to chapter 6. And Nehemiah isn't just trying to move ahead, but he's actually trying to survive. Let me read some of these verses. Nehemiah 6 verse 1. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one village, uh, in, one, in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. So here, Nehemiah... His, his enemies, the people who are resisting the work on the wall, they are trying to lure Nehemiah away and get him to quit. They're trying to stop the work. So even in the midst of the success, Nehemiah has the temptation 
to quit. And what does that look like for him? It's about distractions. They say, let's meet together. Let's go to the plain of Ono, this fertile valley, this wonderful place. They're saying, Nehemiah, don't worry so much about your work. Come meet us. And they ask him once, twice, three, four times. If we go down here, we see four times they send this message. But in verse 3, he says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why would the work stop? They say, come, come to the plain of Ono. And as somebody called out in the first service, they said, oh no. <laughs> Nehemiah says, oh no, I better not go. Distractions. Things that would keep him from doing what God wants him to do. That temptation to quit. Um, for Nehemiah, he had to keep at what he was doing. And so for us, distractions in our life. What are things that keep us from what God wants us to do? I came across this story this week, and I just had to show this picture. This is uh, 1903, Clyde Beatty. And he was one of the first lion tamers to incorporate this. Not the use of the, of the whip, but the use of the stool, the four-legged stool. The tool that lion tamers came to use more than anything else wasn't the whip that was helpful, but the stool. And why the stool? Because the four legs of the stool would confuse the lion. It would distract him. He wouldn't know what to focus on. And so Clyde Beatty and other lion tamers came to use a four-legged stool to distract. And so for us in the same way, to, to stay focused on what God wants us to do, they try to get Nehemiah to quit by slandering him. Notice the fifth time, verse 5. The fifth time, Sam Bellet sent his aide to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter. It's reported among the nations. And Geshem says, it's true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt. The fifth time, it was an unsealed letter. This is what it meant. It was a, a message that was sent from village to village, city to city, spreading gossip, slandering, saying, Nehemiah, you're doing this to revolt. Slander. Slander can keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Slander can weaken us. Verse 9, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. Slander. Criticism. Criticism, if we're, trying to, if we're trying to please people instead of please God, if we're fearing people rather than fearing God, it will stop our work. But notice the end of verse 9. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Underline that phrase in your Bible. Again, Nehemiah is digging deeper. He's trusting in God. He's getting this criticism. And sometimes when we get criticism, and remember this, Criticism is just somebody else's opinion. It's not necessarily reality. But Nehemiah digs deeper. And lastly, there's fear. He says this, One day, verse 10, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of somebody else, who was shut in his house. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. People are, are coming to kill him. What does he do? Does he run away in fear? He digs deeper. He says this in verse 11. Should a man like me run away? Should someone like me go into the temple to save his life, I will not go. Nehemiah says, I will not go. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to quit. I don't care what people are saying. I don't care what kind of fears are being threats that people are making towards me. Should someone like me, should a man like me run away? For us to have that same conviction 
to trust the Lord and the temptations of success to stay true to God and the temptations to quit, to say, no, I'm going to trust God. And in verse 15, it says, the wall was completed and in 52 days, the wall was completed. Nehemiah could have fallen to the fears of self-promotion. He could have fallen to the fears of self-protection. And John Newton's Amazing Grace, in the second verse, he says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." What does he mean by that? Grace, experiencing God, digging deeper, taught my heart to fear, to fear God. And grace, my fears relieved. The fear of self-promotion, the fear of self-protection, the fears, the anxieties that we experience in life, whatever they might be, when we dig deeper, when we trust in God and in his grace, our fears are relieved. God works in a deeper way in our life. We see that in Nehemiah. We see that in Jesus. Jesus, the, the, the sphere of self-promotion. The crowds were following Jesus. They loved Jesus. But what did they want? They didn't want a suffering Messiah. The, the fear of self-protection. Should Jesus go to the cross? Or should he save himself? Think of the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus on the ground, praying with drops of blood. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That fear of God. Jesus is our example. Nehemiah, again, pointing to Jesus. Jesus being the ultimate Nehemiah. Refusing to allow fear to dictate his life, but fearing God, regardless of the circumstance. Self-promotion, self-protection, self. Am I going to live for self, or am I going to live for God? Let's pray together. God, we thank you that when we face challenges in life, and and God, we, we recognize that success can be a challenge. God, when we face a challenge in life that says, I give up, I can't do this. God, the Christian life must not work for me. God, help us to dig deeper. God, give us more of you. Give us more of your grace. God, help us to reach deeper to those springs of water that would well up within us. Lord, thank you for the example of Nehemiah. Thank you for the example of Jesus. God, may may we abide in you. In Jesus' name, amen.